see you the handle welcome everyone well. welcome everyone so um this is gang amir bon again so our speakers for today will be um edmund bon amir hamza uh new sinu joshua te michael chia um, and myself, I'll be the moderator for today. I'm Rashara. Um, so today's headlines in general um, is parliament, roadblocks, and famous employment issues. Um, so Josh will be talking about, in general, roadblocks. Um, Michael will be talking about the current employment issues. Um, Sinyu will be talking about the CMCO and also the conditions uh, the conditions of the CMCO in terms of employment as well. And Edmund and Amir will share their thoughts about the one-day parliamentary sitting. So, um, without further ado, Joshua, please. Okay. Uh, hi, semua. Jadi, saya hari ini ni saya nak cerita sikit lah pasal uh, sekatan jalan raya atau roadblock lah yang dijalankan oleh polis. Um, memang secara kebiasaannya pihak polis dari semasa ke semasa ada membuat sekatan jalan raya lah. Jadi saya pasti um, kamu pernah melihat atau pernah melalui sekatan uh, jalan raya ya yang rutin lah yang, yang secara biasa telah dijalankan. Tapi masa MCO ni kalau kita perhatikan memang terdapat lebih banyak roadblock. Pada mulanya, pada awalnya, uh, pada mula peringkat MCO tu memang banyak tetapi sekarang kita lihat makin berkurangan. Mungkin di kawasan sempadan lah, sempadan negeri masih ada uh, sekatan jalan raya. Jadi uh, secara umumnya, uh, sek- Pihak polis memang ada kuasa untuk menjalankan atau melaksanakan sekatan jalan raya dan tujuannya adalah untuk uh, mencegah uh, mencegah kesalahan, pencegahan kesalahan atau untuk um, detect untuk uh, mengesan kesalahan. Ya. Jadi kalau kita pernah melalui sekatan jalan raya secara kebiasaannya pihak polis mungkin dia tahan kereta, dia minta IC, dia minta uh, lesen, lesen pemandu kemudian mereka akan uh, melihat uh, cukai jalan sama ada masih sarut tag, sama ada masih valid atau tidak ya yeah. dan kadang-kala ada juga sekatan jalan raya bila pihak polis contohnya ingin uh, yang dilakukan pada malam-malam buta atau awal pagi ya, untuk uh, mencegah um, kesalahan memandu uh, di bawah pengaruh alkohol di mana kadang-kadang pihak polis akan cu- cu- uh, mengesan atau akan mengarahkan pemandu untuk uh, menjalankan ujian breathalyzer ya. dan terdapat juga kadang-kadang kes, contohnya kes dada atau sekiranya polis uh, mendapat maklumat mungkin uh, ada berlakunya penculikan atau berlakunya uh, rompakan. Jadi kadang-kadang pihak polis juga akan menjalankan sekatan jalan raya di kawasan-kawasan yang tertentu. Dan terdapat juga, uh, saya ada baca di dalam akhbar sebelum ini dan terdapat juga kawan-kawan yang ada tanya saya di di grup WhatsApp lah dan di mana pihak polis ada kalanya mengarahkan pemandu untuk membuka uh, kereta mereka membuka bot pintu belakang dan sebagainya pihak polis nak memeriksa kereta ya yeah. dan kadang-kadang uh, terdapat situasi di mana pihak polis menjumpai sesuatu bahan terlarang ya yeah, mungkin dada tetapi secara kadang-kadang terdapat juga situasi di mana pihak polis mungkin jumpa sebatang kayu atau mungkin pisau ya yeah, dan pihak polis mungkin menahan kamu atau menanya kamu lebih soalan uh, berkenaan 
berkenaan um, senjata atau objek tersebut. Jadi terdapat seperti yang saya katakan dalam dalam WhatsApp group tu ada kawan-kawan saya dia tanya dia kata boleh ke polis buat macam tu? Dia check mungkin dia kamu bawa kayu untuk keselamatan kamu untuk tujuan keselamatan dan perlindungan kamu. Jadi secara generally secara amnya memang mem, secara teori lah me, memang benda tu memang boleh menjadi satu kesalahan sebab objek tu kalau boleh mendatangkan kecederaan pihak polis uh, boleh mengesyaki bahawa um, atau kamu boleh mengesyaki kamu terlibat dengan satu kesalahan di bawah uh, akta senjata sorry, akta bahan-bahan kakisan dan letupan dan senjata berbahaya sebab dalam akta tersebut definasi uh, senjata adalah apa-apa objek yang boleh mendatangkan kecederaan jadi ia tidak sahaja uh, terhad kepada pisau, parang atau bom atau uh, pistol ia juga boleh mungkin sebatang kayu ya, atau satu batang besi juga boleh dikira sebagai satu Uh, senjata yang dilarang. Ya, yeah? jadi uh, kalau jadi kepada secara secara kesimpulan, secara pihak polis memang ada kuasa di bawah undang-undang untuk nombor satu menjalankan sekatan jalan raya, nombor dua untuk menanya kamu atau meminta kamu untuk uh, mengenalkan diri atau um, membuka kereta anda ya, untuk mereka menjalankan pemeriksaan. Jadi sekiranya kamu berada dalam situasi tersebut nasihat saya ialah kamu kamu uh, sorry itu janganlah melawan pihak polis ya sebab dan cuba beri kerjasama dan bertolak ansur kepada dengan pihak polis kerana nombor satu uh, pihak polis tu memang dia dia pun ada mereka memang menjalankan kerja lah dan kadang-kadang ap, apabila mereka melakukan sekatan jalan raya mungkin bukan mungkin mereka sememangnya meletakkan nyawa mereka dalam bahaya ya jadi kalau kita baca berita akhir baru-baru ni terdapat juga beberapa insiden ya di mana terdapat pemandu mabuk telah melanggar atau bertempur sekatan jalan raya jadi Uh, mereka terdedah kepada risiko lah terhadap uh, kepada nyawa mereka. Jadi kita cubalah menghormati dan beri kerjasama kepada pihak polis. Uh, walau bagaimanapun, kalau uh, sebelum itu, kalau saya tahu lah masa MCO ni mungkin banyak uh, dari kalangan kita mempunyai stres tekanan ya. Jadi Janganlah kita bila kita tunggu atau kita melalui roadblock tu kita menjerit kepada pihak polis atau memaki hamun ya macam kita, kalau kita baca berita terdapat beberapa individu uh, kerana akibat sekatan jalan raya tu ada kesesakan ya jadi mereka telah memarahi uh, pihak polis ya. dan kalau kita ingat mungkin kisah ni 2 tahun 3 tahun dulu terdapat juga Ya, sesetengah ses, uh, sesetengah orang individu telah menggunakan steering lock untuk uh, mengacar pihak berkuasa ya, atau mengancam untuk memukul pihak berkuasa. Jadi dalam situasi tersebut pihak polis sebenarnya boleh menangkap uh, individu tersebut dan boleh menuduh uh, individu tersebut untuk kesalahan menghalang Uh, penjawat awam melakukan tugas ya yeah. uh, tapi walau apa pun kalau pihak polis melakukan sesuatu di luar bidang kuasa mereka ya yeah, sekiranya contohnya sekiranya mereka menampar menyepak kamu atau uh, mereka meminta uh, rasuah duit kopi untuk kau tim ya yeah, dan kalau kita ba- dan baru-baru ni kalau kita ada baca akhbar terdapat dakwaan Uh, oleh dua wanita Mongolia bahawa terdapat seorang pegawai polis yang telah uh, 
mengganggu mereka secara seksual dan juga merogol ni dakwaan mereka lah sama ada benar ke tak kita tak tahu jadi kalau dalam situasi tersebut um, kalau kamu mengesyaki atau kamu merasakan pihak polis telah menjalankan kuasa mereka di luar bidang kuasa mereka jadi um, dua perkara kamu perlu uh, perlu buat satu ialah kamu cuba ambil nombor badan polis anggota atau pegawai polis tersebut atau nama mereka dan kemudian kamu buat report uh, polis dengan serta-merta ya yeah. jadi uh, saya pun dah cakap sepanjang 10 minit saya rasa untuk cukuplah Uh, setakat ini uh, yang sekali saya nak ulas perkenaan uh, cekatan jalan raya sekiranya kamu ada apa-apa soalan lanjut kamu boleh tanya ya di, uh, di di ruangan komen di Facebook dan kami akan cuba menjawab soalan anda. Terima kasih. Okay, terima kasih Joshua. Harap kalian lebih tahu tentang hak Ha anda dan juga kuasa pihak polis. Um, next on, we will have Michael to talk about the current employment issues um, during the CMCO. Uh, please, Michael. Hi, everyone. Uh, I will be sharing on the health and safety aspect of employment today. Uh, as the economy starts to reopen, I think many employers are racing to get back to work and many employees I I know we're already asked to go back to work, some by Wednesday, some by next week, uh, except for those who are prohibited to do so under the Prevention and Control of Infectious Diseases Regulation and those in the enhanced and fewer areas. Uh, both employers and employees have a duty to ensure health and safety are kept during operations in this pandemic and, uh, and also under this control movement, uh, uh, this conditional movement control order. For employers, employers have a statutory duty under the Occupational Safety and Health Act 1994 uh, to ensure that every employee so far as practicable uh, uh, are safe and uh, are safe and also uh, ensure that the health, health and safety and welfare of the employees uh, are ensured, you know, as far as practicable. Employers also have the duty to make sure those who are not the employees but involved in the conduct uh, of the everyday business are not exposed to health and safety risks. For example, uh, em workers who are, uh, third, uh, who are hired from third-party employment companies that work in the premise of your business. Okay? So these people are also, uh, are also included. And, the other, and also any other people who may be exposed to the health and safety risk during your operations. For example, a visiting customer uh, at your premise. So you must ensure that these people are also not exposed to health and safety risk. Uh, if an employer, so if an employer does not comply with these duties, uh, the employer com would commit an offense. He can be liable of, of to a fine not exceeding 50,000 ringgit or to an imprisonment for a term not exceeding two years. Okay, so that's, that's, that's one aspect. Uh, of employer's duty. Under common law, the employer also has a similar duty. And now that there are there is there are SOPs in place. Okay. So SOP is being issued by the government for employers uh, if they want to carry out their business. And a failure to comply with these SOPs uh, may also be an offense under the prevention and control of infectious disease regulation. For example, uh, in the legal industries employers are required to take temperature of the employees of people who uh, come to their premises, record the attendance, ensure that there's social distancing in the premise, being provided face masks ha or hand sanitizers to be used and etc. Okay, so th those are those are the duties that are in place for uh, employers for employees to comply. Uh, as for employees, also under the Occupational Safety and Health Act 1994, uh, it, it also imposes the same duty on employees. For example, to take reasonable care of the safety of yourself and to other persons who may be affected by your your acts or your omissions, okay? Um, and also, you need to cooperate and comply with the health and safety measures and uh, use PPE and to be to be given and to be used and to use the PPE that's given to you, uh, among other duties that 
that you're required to do. So the question arises is, if you are forced to go back to work uh, during this CMCO, uh, and then you see that the SOPs are not in place by your employer, uh, and that, you know, it will put you at, 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 a, at a, and you think that it may put you at a certain risk. So what can you do? Firstly, I think the first thing you can do, uh, I think the police has also made a statement on this online, I mean, uh, through, through uh, media statements and all, and you can see through the news reportings for the past few days that police will make will enforce the SOPs and uh, those employees who do not comply the, with the SOPs uh, will actually be taken against them. So you can make a police report. Okay. So uh, secondly, you can also complain to the uh, Department of Labor Okay. Uh, <clears throat> thirdly, uh, given that the SOPs are not in place and you will be exposed to risk, you know, risk of being infected by COVID, and and that risk will not allow you to carry out your job fun- job function properly, or will not totally will not allow you to carry out job job function, or uh, if, in carrying out your job function without these safety measures in place, you put other people around you at risk. Okay, of being uh, infected by COVID and, and all that, okay? Uh, or if your contract requires that health and safety measures be taken to ensure uh, your safety, but then this not taken, then there is an option of a possibility to, cite, to, to terminate your contract and cite contractive dismissal. But be sure to exhaust all the other options I mentioned earlier and seek legal advice before considering constructive dismissal. So, uh, yeah, I hope I hope I hope that uh helps in this help helps you in this situation and uh if you have any further questions please feel free to drop it in the comments and we'll try to answer them later. Thanks. Thank you, Michael. Um so yeah, everybody bear in mind that if your employers do not comply with the SOP, um it is an offense. Um next off we have a uh, new seeing you. Um, who will be talking about uh, the CMCO in general. Um, before that, we actually have a question um, regarding the Prevention and Control Infectious Disease Act. Um, so I'll just read out the questions for the question for Sinyu. <clears throat> um, so the act's use now is the uh, Prevention and Control Infectious Disease Act, um, where the minister responsible is the health ministry while the MKN is chaired by the Prime Minister himself. So during this MCO, which instrument of law is actually being used, the MKN or the um, Infectious Disease Act? And thus the power of the MKN um, ends when the MCO ends. Um, Sinyu, will you, can you answer that please? Uh, thanks. Uh, thank you for that question because uh, this is a question that you know, has been asked uh, a few occasions already uh, whether or not we are actually under a security area or uh, controlled by the MKN or are we under an infected area. Um, I think for the public, uh, this distinction is something that is not apparent to them. So um, we have to look at what the regulation says. The regulation since 18th of March has been uh, one that is made under the Prevention and Control of Infectious Disease Act. It wasn't one that was made under the National Security Council Act. So that's quite important because what the Minister has uh, declared and gazetted since 18 of March are infected areas instead of security areas. So infected areas uh, would be what the minister is able to declare under the uh, Prevention and Control of Diseases Act and security area would be uh, what the minister, and this is another ministry actually, it's a prime minister, sorry, not another ministry, what the prime minister would be able to declare under the uh, NSC Act. Uh, we have not seen the prime minister exercise his powers under the NSC Act, even though we have seen uh, press conferences and we have seen press statements or reference being made in the media to the uh, National Security Council to the MKN but I think what what uh, the ministers or the government department or the uh, DG of health meant was they 
make decisions in consultation with the NSC. Because the NSC, even though they do not exercise their powers under the NSC Act, they still play an advisory and consultative role on issues of national security under the NSC Act. So let me just dig out the uh, NSC Act. So the functions of the National Security Council is uh, A, to formulate policies and strategic measures on national security, uh, including sovereignty, territorial integrity, defense, social political stability, economic stability, strategic resources, national unity, and other interests predicting national security. Uh, B, to monitor and implementation of the policies and strategic measures on national security. C, to advise on the declaration of security areas, and D, to perform any functions related to national security. So, even though it hasn't gone so far to uh, this pandemic, you know, it hasn't reached the point where a national emergency or national security has been called, but uh, I think one would uh, not be able to deny that uh, it does relate in a way to issues of national security and public health even though it's different, but uh, it, it's, 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 it intersects, if I can put it that way. So that's why I think uh, there has been consultation between the uh, minister under the Prevention and Control of Diseases Act, or the DG uh, of Health, with the National Security Council. Because I think there are other considerations that they may not be able to decide by themselves, such as economic factors, uh, closing of uh, travel, and uh, that's why you see reference uh, being made. So the answer to that question is that, yeah, it's it's different. Uh, we have not seen NFC being used, and everything so far, including the regulations, uh, includes uh, which includes the enhanced, enhanced movement control order, uh, those are all regulations that were made under the uh, Prevention and Control of Diseases Act. Thanks. Right. Thank you, Sinyu. I hope that clarifies um, your question. Um, next off, um, maybe um, Edmund can give his thoughts on the one-day parliamentary sitting. Um, there is a media statement currently released, so maybe um, Edmund can share his thoughts first on this. Edmund, please. Thank you, Shara. Hello, everyone. I know that the media has played up this issue of the one-day parliament and the confusion over the motions that have been put forward. So I'll just give a bit of an overview on the law, and then Ame will make his comments as well uh, on, on the position uh, that we will see on the 18th of May. The first point, I think, is the importance of the speaker. So the speaker is like the master of the house. He's the master of the universe. Uh, the speaker, um, Honorable Arif Yusof, is actually like the master of the parliament. Uh, he, he, he actually controls parliament and he has a lot of uh, discretionary powers. That's why the speaker... Yeah, it's an important position and it's an important role. And that's why you saw yesterday, I think, in Malacca, there were some attempts to remove the speaker. This was also the position in 2009 in Perak where they forcibly removed the then uh, speaker, Sivakuma. So the first point about the speaker is that while there is no law or no regulation under the Dewan Rakyat Standing Orders, Ratran, Pratran, Mishwarat, as to how long you fix the period for parliament to sit. So first, the standing order doesn't say how long parliament must sit. So theoretically, parliament, legally, parliament can sit for one day, it can sit for 24 hours, it can sit for 48 hours, it can sit for 10 days. So while there's no rule to say how long parliament can sit, then it should be a decision that rests uh, with the speaker. And that's why the second point I make is that it is unclear from the motions and the decision of the speaker in his press statement whether he will uh, allow the extension of parliament sitting for more than one day. 
And this is something that we will have to wait and see on the 18th of May. Of course, in a democracy, there are a few uh, points that need to be borne in mind. One, there are certain things that parliament need to do apart from just the king's uh, speech. Uh, in this example, the pre hatin budget that has been given out by government, if it is coming out from the government funds, it needs to be, there needs to be a new law. There needs to be what is called a supplementary supply bill. And it seems that in this one day sitting, government is not presenting such a bill. If it is not presenting such a bill, then the pre hatin subsidies or the use of government money will be illegal. So that for me is one important point that needs to be stressed that if you try and introduce a bill, you need to introduce the bill in law. And I'm sure one day for debate on the bill uh, is not sufficient. Of course, there is the motions of uh, no confidence. That is another issue which the speaker can decide whether it's urgent, whether it's pressing, and whether he will let it be uh, tabled and, and, and discussed. So in this time of uh, situation, of course, with COVID, um, we understand that there are constraints in parliament uh, sitting, but we need to bear in mind that COVID should not be used as a reason to restrict unnecessarily the rights of parliamentarians and the rights of people for, for, for proper debates to happen in parliament. Uh, if debates can happen in one day, then fine and good, but we know practically it will not happen. The second, um, I think, bigger picture is about what we saw again yesterday as to removing the speaker. Again, the only standing order in the Dewan Rakyat, uh, which is standing order three, I believe, uh, allows for a speaker first to be appointed by the House on a vacancy after a general election. That's why when Arif was uh, uh, appointed, um, and now there may be questions with the change in the administration of the government, whether the current government wants to uh, replace him with, a, with another speaker. It looks as if the standing orders do not provide for such a provision. And therefore, as the master of the house, master of parliament, the speaker can decide uh, whether a motion to remove him or whether a motion to replace him uh, should be um, uh, debated or not. Whatever happens within the house is not something that the courts can um, intervene or take action on unless it is plainly against the law or it is plainly illegal. Therefore, if there's a lot of discretion given to the speaker and the speaker exercises his decision one way or another or exercises his discretion one way or another, it's very hard to challenge it in court. So again, this issue about whether the speaker will be replaced or whether the speaker will be uh, allowing a motion to debate uh, his position uh, is something that we'll, we will have to look forward to on 18 of May. Uh, but then again, the, quest, the, the question that keeps coming back is whether one day is enough uh, for all these uh, difficult matters uh, to be decided. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I think Amir has something to say. Right? Okay. Thank you, Edmund. Um, next, Amir. Um, I think, Amir, your microphone is muted. Um, Ami, so, I'm muted. Yeah, yes. All right, sorry about that. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, uh, Edmund. Um, the one day parliamentary sitting is a very interesting issue, an important issue nonetheless. Uh, it deals with, uh, it, it, will, uh, it will show as to how we move forward as a democracy. Uh, what Emma correctly pointed out, uh, the bill that has to be debated about the supplementary bill with regard to the spending during this MCO, it is a very crucial, important bill that has to be debated. But putting that aside, we have seen 
uh, important motions being uh, tabled or submitted to the speaker to be debated. Um, in terms of uh, public, some public, you can see comments in the social media, some have expressed concern whether the motion of no confidence ought to be debated during this period or whether we should be focusing on COVID. That is a social issue, that is a public discussion. I mean, there is no right or wrong answer to that particular question. It cannot be answered straightforward because on one hand, we're dealing with a very important issue about whether the government of the day has the mandate uh, to decide as to how we move forward. And if we do not have a government that has the mandate, then whatever decided by the government can be challenged. On the other hand, we can understand the concern of the public about now we're dealing with a pandemic issue. Uh, politicking will, may affect uh, how we move forward in order to deal with the current pandemic situation. So there is no right or wrong answer. This is where the speaker has a very tough issue that he has to decide on the coming parliamentary sitting. But one important point I would like to highlight from the motions that have been tabled is that we can, we can try to draw, uh, bring attention to what happened in Sabah after the election. If you can see that in Sabah, uh, Tan Sri Musa Aman was initially sworn in as the Chief Minister of Sabah. He was rightfully sworn in as the Chief Minister of Sabah. And then there's an issue that saying that he no longer commands the confidence of the majority. Uh, and he was asked to dis he was asked to relinquish his position as the chief minister. And uh, as you know, after that, uh, Shafi Abdal uh, was sworn in as the chief minister without any motion of no confidence being tabled or debated in the Dewan Undangan Negeri Sabah. If you look at what happened in Sabah and then you look at what happened in Parliament now, currently, you can see that once Tan Sri Muhyiddin had been sworn in as the Prime Minister, even though you have certain MPs who claim that he no longer commands the majority, he no longer has the majority, but they did not go by way of producing statute declarations to the Agong. What they did, what the current opposition uh, did, they, they, they table motion of no confidence against the current prime minister whom they claim no longer commands the uh, confidence of the majority. So this is an interesting development uh, from the question of uh, law point of view. So uh, we should observe and see what will transpire on the 18th, whether the right way of like doing things will be upheld or whether we're going to revert back to the old ways of willing and dealing behind, uh, behind the parliament or behind Close doors in order to determine who commands the majority. Uh, that, that's all I have to add and uh, say. Thanks. Thank you, Ami. Well, that is certainly quite insightful. Um, so we will proceed to our first question. Sekejap, that, was, that was asked today, okay? Uh, so um, in the event of a roadblock, is the auxiliary police um, have the power to conduct seek and search task in your vehicle, or is this, or, or is it must be conducted by a police officer? Uh, maybe Joshua, you can answer this. Yep. Uh, thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, so, first, first thing you must remember is uh, an auxiliary police uh, or policeman, assuming that his appointment is valid, he carries the same. Uh, duties and power of a normal policeman, right? So the only difference uh, between a normal policeman and an auxiliary police is that an auxiliary police is usually confined to a place where they are posted specifically. So for example, I think if we look at uh, KLIA, uh, Post Malaysia, we will see uh, auxiliary policemen on duty or even in the LRT stations, right? So they only have... Uh, powers exercisable by a police officer in that particular area where they are posted. Um, so to answer that question, the short answer is yes, uh, but, subject, but subject to the area where they are posted. So I think an example where, where we can see auxiliary police carrying out so-called roadblocks to inspect your car, I think would be um, KL Hilton, if I'm not mistaken. 
uh, I think just before you enter the car park, I think there will be police, uh, uh, auxiliary police, uh, policemen at the entrance to stop you and just to check the undercarriage and the boot of your car to see whether there's any explosives or uh, any other contraband item. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you, Joshua. Um, we have the next question. Um, employers are asking workers to sign agreement for lower wages. Is that possible? Um, Michael, can you answer this, please? Hi, yeah. Um, okay, so basically, as I mentioned in the previous uh, chit chats that we had, um, employers cannot unilaterally uh, force an employee to take a pay cut, all right? Um, and they cannot force them to sign an agreement for lower wages uh, to that effect. So um, if 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 the if the employer wants to lower their wages, there has to be an agreement between uh, between both parties. You know, both parties have to agree and say that okay, I agree to this uh, reduction in my wages, but it cannot be uh, unilateral. Uni unilaterally done by the employer or being forced upon the employee. If it's being forced upon the employee, then the employee has the right uh, to to ha has the option to terminate the con uh, the contract and cite constructive dismissal, uh, and and make file a complaint to the uh, direct the director of industrial relations. Uh, okay, so and if if it's being forced on the employee who like earns who is, you know, falls within the permit of the Employment Act between 2,000 to 5,000 ringgit, who owns uh, for wages between 2,000 and 5,000 ringgit, then he can also make a complaint to the Director General of uh, Labour uh, without even, what do you call it, without even uh, citing constructive dismissal. He can go straight away. So these are the options that are available. So in short, uh, employers cannot uh, ask or force workers to sign uh, an agreement for to lower their wages that that is that is uh not right right thank you michael um the next question we have uh <coughs> also from the same person um can employers during mco period do not conduct di and based on show cost letter and reply uh terminate workers or sack workers uh, maybe Sinyu, you can answer this, please. Yeah. No, because if the employer is already allowed to operate, you know, uh, and now you have ministers saying that you can operate at full capacity, those who have approval, there is no reason why being at full capacity you cannot conduct uh, the I. So it's it's quite it's quite obvious that uh, you can the. I think, I think the underlying problem that we have here is that employers, they are capitalizing on uh, the current situation where everyone, regardless of industry, they are uh, trying to reduce costs and they are do trying to reduce costs by going through means that are uh, not exactly legal. So you see a lot of employers doing that. Whether or not their industry are actually uh, affected by COVID-19. Uh, and, and, you know, that, that is something that is also prevalent in the legal industry. Uh, I would think that the legal industry, we are not as hit, some areas are not as badly hit by uh, COVID-19 as compared to others. But you see a lot of employers uh, they, you know, decide to reduce or cut or terminate employees uh, just like that in an attempt to save costs. So a lot of employers, they're just jumping on this uh, bandwagon uh, to uh, justify whatever they're doing uh, is right. And, you know, it's, 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 it's not. Uh, and, uh, you, you know, it goes back to uh, all these employment issues that we have uh, heard uh, in the past two or three sessions. And, you know, it, it really comes down to this, that uh, employers, they, and, you know, it's not, it's not entirely the fault of employers because it's a, it's, a, it's a problem with the system. That when you, when times are good, 
they profit, you know. But this profit that they make, they they use it as capital to uh, borrow more or to start another businesses. So liability increases even though profit keeps coming in. Uh, and you know that all this borrowing, all these loans, uh, starting of new ventures, starting of new business is of course good for growth, but it, it's supported by this underlying uh, assumption that there will always be income. And when income stops, you're not able to pay off all these loans and all these borrowings uh, because you know the cash flow has stopped. So you you use money that you don't have and you're not able to pay uh, when money stops coming in and you know that 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 is really the problem so employers are trying to uh, scrape whatever uh, money they can get through cost saving measures and you know it's it's always the ones at the bottoms that are being uh, taken away. The rights and bottles are the ones that are always being taken away and they are always the ones that are being affected because employers in that situation, they can only hit the bottom. They may or may not, you know, uh, uh, take the hit themselves. But what is uh, for sure is that they cannot uh, try and get the ones at the top to uh, reduce whatever liabilities that they have because the power imbalance is there so naturally you know you would always try to take away uh, what the bottom have in order to compensate uh, yourself so that's a problem we see here and that's why all these employment issues are coming up is because of uh, this system of us of employers using monies they don't have so yeah sorry i i, I digress no, not All right, thank you, seeing you. Um, next off, we have a question for Ame. Um, so this person says, thank you for mentioning Sabah in your discussion. Um, I would like to have your opinion on his decision recently by seeking the Agong, but about the seats of parliament taking into account the state government back in Sabah was made through back door. So, um, Ami, maybe you can provide a bit of your thoughts about this. Okay, that, that's a question uh, from uh, one of the listeners pertaining to uh, the Sabah situation and whether it will affect the current federal government or the previous federal government. I, I will not want to go into that because uh, that, 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 that will create another legal issue. But suffice to say that with regard to the current situation in Sabah, with regard to the dispute uh, between the previous Chief Minister Tan Sri Musa Aman against uh, the current Chief Minister, the matter is still pending at the federal court. And one of the issues is whether or not Tan Sri Musa Aman was rightfully, lawfully uh, removed as being the Chief Minister who was duly sworn in, the first Chief Minister who was duly sworn in. Uh, that decision, one way or the other, will in a way have an effect as to the composition of the federal government whether we like it or not. So it is important for us to ensure that from now onwards, especially, if you want to do something, it has to be done properly in a very transparent manner. And we could not tolerate any more backdoor wheeling and dealing. This whole practice of using statutory declaration should not be condoned. So if we have any issue with, uh, with regard to the leader of the government of the day if you want to remove the said person the right manner to go about is to challenge a terrible motion uh, against the said person in the parliament or in the dewan undangan negeri that should be the way forward uh, this whole practice of using statutory declaration 
uh, it is is something that we should no longer tolerate. It has created a lot of problem. We can see uh, that happen in the Perak case. It happened in the Sabah case. And it happened in the at the federal government level. So hopefully the court, the judiciary, will take a bold move and decide once and for all as to how uh, the confidence of a prime minister or chief minister should be decided. I think that that's uh, what I have to say with regard to the query post. Thank you. All right, thank you, thank you Ami. Um, the next question we have is, can the distri distribution of BPN without passing the supplementary bill be challenged in court? And will it be a breach of separation of powers? Um, maybe Edmund, you can answer this, please. Thank you um, for the question. <clears throat> First of all, I want to say that it looks like there are many socialist people trolling us with questions. Uh, and thank you very much for these questions. Some of you look like you're from Party Socialist Malaysia um, with the T-shirts that you're wearing. And uh, we hope that we will continue to um, help uh, what you are doing to help the people on the ground because we know that um, you are supporting and, and helping or the marginalized, vulnerable, and the poor groups. Um, of course, Ami, I think, wants to join PSM, but nobody wants to give him an application form. So perhaps <laughs> I think can probably just give him an application form. Um, just to quickly answer the question, uh, yes, I think if you don't have a supplementary supply bill, um, it's going to be an illegal use of government funds. But of course, if the, the government funds or so-called funds come from GLCs or they come from government-linked companies that don't come from the, 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 the consolidated budget, then um, that can be justified without uh, having necessarily a bill. So we do not know where the funds are coming from. Uh, you need a su supplementary supply bill uh, to provide for those funds. Uh, and that should be done as soon as possible, especially if the funds have already been spent. Uh, and bear in mind, Supplementary supply bills happen all the time. So in Malaysia, when you see the budget being presented, you have a supply bill. So you look at the budget and say, okay, this is the X sum that government spends. But quietly, not quietly, but without the media attention being uh, focused on the other bills, later on in parliamentary sittings, government always introduces supplementary supply bills. And you will see that those supplementary supply bills are always, um, there's not really a media attention. There's a lot of money spent there, and that is in addition to the actual budget, the main budget that you see. Therefore, this supplementary supply bill uh, should be presented as soon as possible to legalize the distribution of the pre hatin funds. However, technically, I'm not sure if the government is afraid that it may not have support for such a bill. So that's why they do not want, they, they, I'm thinking that they do not want to present it at this parliament, at this sitting, because they may lose the supply bill. And once you lose the supply bill by convention, it means that you do not have the confidence of the majority of MPs and therefore your government is a minority government. So it may be a tactical decision that you do not want to present the pre hunting um, supplementary supply bill. To your question as to whether it can be challenged in court, yes, of course it can be challenged in court because it's a matter that uh, deals with the legality of certain executive action. However, the practical point will be uh, if you ask the court to strike down the distribution, means if the money had already been spent just because there's no supplementary supply bill, then what you're going to do is that, in effect, uh, people will have to give back the money or, in effect, government will have to find some way to close the hole. Uh, so the practical effect may not be necessarily something that um, uh, you know, people want to do uh, but and, and may not want to take it to the courts because the courts may not be the co correct forum. But if the government is using our funds in a way that is not transparent, is not accountable and is not legal because there's no bill, then the discussion has to be taken uh, on the streets. Uh, discussion has to be taken in the Kedai Kopi or the uh, coffee shops and the political forums and to exert pressure on the government why they have not presented a supplementary supply bill. 
I think there's a second question. Uh, I can deal with that as well uh, on the standing orders. The standing orders uh, do not, uh, spe of course, does not specifically set out uh, in very great detail what are the matters to be decided in Parliament or to be debated in Parliament. By convention, usually government matters are to be uh, discussed first, of course. Um, so it normally we have the king's speech, and then it will normally have the, the, the government matters and government paper orders. I'm not, I've not seen what the order has been uh, in the timetable of parliament, but it looks as if, uh, I may be wrong, that it's only the king's speech and then they are going to wrap. I've not seen any other matter, and therefore, if there are motions that are put in that, you know, do not... Uh, that, that there are, motions can be put in any time. So as long as motions are put in, the speaker has to decide whether to debate the motion or not. Because there's no, there doesn't seem as if there's any government uh, matter on the order list. So I, unless I'm, I, I see other things on the, uh, the order list, and I would think that the first thing on the order list should be to approve the supplementary supply bill. And this is something that may be too late already because you have 14 days notice, uh, you need 14 days notice under the standing orders and it's not been put in so i think not only are people questioning why is it only one day but people are questioning if it's one day what exactly are you going to do in one day why is it one day when there's when you are in charge as government so-called government why are you not putting things forward to discuss for example the supply bill so i hope that answers that question Shada, you are muted. Sorry, sorry. Thank you, Edmund. Um, so we have another follow-up question um, regarding, I'll just read out the question. Um, I think pretty much Edmund has dealt a bit into that, but I'll just read out the question anyway. Um, in other, um, yesterday, in another forum, it was said that the House must first resolve um, government matters and must follow the list as put by the government. Can the speaker, in brackets, PH appointed, uh, decide otherwise? Um, maybe Sinyu or can answer this? Hi, uh, thanks, Saru, for that question. Uh, I think in the natural, in the usual course of things, uh, that would be the case. But when there is a motion of no confidence, uh, that would, you know, be considered as I think uh, under the standing order, it would be considered something that is uh, an emergency uh, or urgent uh, business. So that would have to uh, that can take precedence if the speaker so decides uh, before any other business of the house. And I think it's 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 only logical uh, that is the case because if if it's if it's if the motion of no confidence succeeds, then whatever uh, government business that there may be, uh, you know, it would be academic to discuss them further. Uh, and it, 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 you you are effectively putting the cut before the horse here. If you hear the government motion and then everything was, you know, later. Uh, debated in the motion of okay, no confidence, and it turns out that the motion of no confidence uh, succeeds. Then what happens to all the businesses that were discussed before? So it's 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 not logical that way, and the speaker certainly has uh, the power to decide uh, what goes on uh, the order of business within uh, parliament. And if you talk about uh, separation of powers, you know it's again. Uh, logical that the speaker and not the government decides, because the government, it, the government is the executive and parliament is the legislative body. So one, uh, one shouldn't uh, dictate. I wouldn't say dictate. They can, they can, they can go about their business, of course, because that is that is uh, the usual course of things. But they cannot bind the speaker. Cannot bind parliament. Uh, so yeah, that's that's the answer. 
thank you. Hello. Thank you, Sinu. Um, so we have time for one more last question. Um, right. It's maybe Edmund can answer this. Um, motion of confidence as well as motion of no confidence, what are the impact and implications? Thank you, uh, Shara, and thank you for all your questions again. I'm sorry um, we are running out of time. It seems that there are so many questions that we have to deal with, uh, but I think we can do another session next week, number four. Um, we wanted to talk about the right to health. We actually today, we were prepared to actually deal with the issue of the right to health, right to health care as a right, rather as a charity, rather than as a charity. We also wanted to talk about a proposed or something has been discussed in 2000, the year 2000, a proper universal health care national health financing mechanism that covers all the vulnerable groups because COVID is an opportunity to really allow Malaysia and the Malaysian government to revamp and enhance our healthcare system, um, to, to give more resources to the public healthcare rather than you know insurers or private health uh, providers. But I think we can talk about that the, ne the next time because the right to health is really, really important um, as a right. Uh, but since we, we don't have much time, I'll just answer the last question. If you look at the two different motions, by convention, a motion of no confidence is always in the negative, meaning if people support the motion of no confidence, government falls. So by convention, it's always drafted in a way that you have no confidence in something or someone or somebody, right? A motion of confidence is a bit um, less conventional. So therefore, I would think that the speaker, if they were to look, the speaker were looking at the motion of no confidence, uh, motion of confidence, would be quite right to reject it, because a motion of confidence in someone assumes that there is already a problem. So you need to have that problem first. You need to have a no confidence answer first, and then only have that confidence. In this in this situation. While there may be people who are unhappy about what happened with the change in government and the process and the flaws in our constitution or our appointment system, um, the king has already um, appointed the prime minister and therefore it is assumed for the moment that when parliament sits, the PM, whoever he is, is the person with confidence because that is the discretion vested in the young Yipotuan Agon. So young Yipotuan Agon has decided in his own mind, in his own judgment, that the PM commands the majority of the support of the members of parliament, and therefore he has appointed him as prime minister. When, they come, when, when prime minister then calls house to order in parliament and um, uh, starts parliamentary session, Opposition may then put in a motion of no confidence. That's the convention. It is highly unconventional to have a motion of confidence. Therefore, the, any motions of confidence put in for either person, or even I think there was talk about this um, sometime back by some um, uh, uh, political parties about having a motion of confidence, it's very strange because um, in our system, the young Lipotuan Agong already has decided um, that that whether rightly or wrongly, that a certain person has confidence. So that's the difference. Um, the implications are simple. If the motion of uh, no confidence passes, or if, for example, a supply bill, like the budget, uh, fails, it means that the, the Prime Minister and the government of day does not have the majority support. Uh, two things can happen. Prime Minister goes to Yang Nipotno Agong and says, I'm resigning, and Yang, uh, Yang Nipotno Agong says, okay, I'm going to appoint somebody else or I'm going to um, call for uh, fresh general elections. I hope that answers your question. We may need to have another session for that. But uh, on healthcare, I think for some, all of us, um, is something that is very close to our heart. It's something that uh, we have not been talking about enough. We have not talking about it in terms of the, uh, the right, a human right to health. I think we should talk about it uh, at the next session. Uh, thank you, Cheryl. All right, thank you, Edmund. So that concludes our session today. Stay tuned for our next session next week um, on the 19th at 12 o'clock. 
Um, so stay tuned, guys. We'll be talking about right to health. All right. So see you. Bye.